Welcome to the Fredrickson Health Show, highlighting expert practitioners from health, fitness, injury prevention, functional medicine, and integrative medicine. If you are into upgrading and optimizing your health, this podcast is for you. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here is your host, Dr. Robert Fredrickson. All right, friends, we are back for another episode on the Fredrickson Health Show. Today, we have the very privilege and honor of having Dr. Orlando, uh, Dr. Orlando Landrum on the podcast today. So Dr. Landrum, thanks so much for coming on today. For anyone listening, please introduce yourself. Let us know who you are and how you got into this form of regenerative medicine. First of all, I just want to thank you so much for having me on your show. Um, I've had a chance to listen to you know and some of your uh, previous podcasts and it's phenomenal. So to have me as a guest, I'm really privileged to be able to be here. Of course, we're so, happy to have you. Orlando Landrum. Um, I'm a, a physician that is originally trained through anesthesia and interventional pain, did training in Boston and New York, and uh, was practicing pain for a period of time. And uh, how I got into this is actually through a patient, interestingly enough. And, um, you know, if we have these sometimes these dichotomous points in our life, right? Or you could take one path, you could take the other path. And I had a patient I thought I was doing pretty good with, and I thought I was a pretty decent doc. And the patient came to me and he says, you're good, but you're not that good. And he's like, I went to this other place in Colorado and you can be better. Why don't you figure out what they're doing and see if you can be a better doc from it? So I could have said, oh, you know what? Forget this guy. He's put a wrinkle in my day. What the heck? But clearly I was like, you know what? Well, maybe they got something, you know? Maybe they got something that's, that's better. So that's what I did. I went to Colorado and I was like, all right, well, let me figure out if this entity, which is called Regenix, is doing something that's unique and uh, it maybe can add to my practice. And at the time I was using ultrasound pretty aggressively. And I thought I was a pretty good ultrasonographer for a doctor, right? I didn't do it all day, but it's something I did pretty decently. And I went out there and these guys are gals, these guys and gals, they were basically looking at small connections of the meniscus into the areas of the joint, how this area of this coronary ligament keeps the meniscus in versus not. And if this changes, it causes you problems like a disc extrusion, hastens you to have problems and causes you issues with instability and things. And I was like, we don't normally look at this. It's just, you just look at the joint. You might look at the cartilage, maybe a tendon, you know, here and there, but we're not looking at the interconnectivity. And so I was like, all right, this guy was right. <laughs> Let me there figure out how I can be better. And so that was really kind of the, the starting point of starting to learn regenerative medicine, but in particularly in context of being able to see where you're placing whatever orthobiologic you're trying to place in context to what's going on with the patient. And it's one of the few places that for me, personally in my experience, most of the time we use imaging modalities separate from clinical exam. We say, oh, it's an x-ray, oh, it's this. But we don't say, oh, okay, when you move your knee like this, when does it hurt? All right, let's see the imaging when it hurts and let's see the imaging when it doesn't hurt. And that's one of the things that really helped accentuate how to be able to look at that patient uh, without being too kind of, I guess, glib in their true totality of saying, all right, let's identify who you are and what's bothering you, particularly the things that bother you for the things that are incredibly important to you that you can't do. That's awesome. So you're using ultrasound with injections to pinpoint not only the precise anatomy, but also the movement that's causing the anatomy to be dysfunctional. Correct. So we use ultrasound and we use fluoroscopy. And right now we're actually looking at some other modalities that may be able to help augment that too. So we can be able to kind of put it all together. Awesome. How long have you been doing the uh, regenerative side of medicine for? We've been doing regenerative medicine now about five years. About five years. And before that, you were an anesthesiologist. Is that correct, too? Yeah, I was doing interventional pain for about another 10 years prior to getting into regenerative medicine. So you have a unique background because you're dealing with, you know, chronic pain for a while. Then you got into the healing side of medicine. And so I just want to ask, why do you think some people don't heal as well as others? Because you've seen both sides of that connection, right? So what, what do you think that is? 
Yeah, so I, I think that's a, a mixture of a couple things. So historically, you know, in traditional allopathic medicine, we've said, oh, well, you know, it's that person's just, it's just their makeup. And then if it's their makeup, they don't do things that could be able to help that. Well, we're always, I won't say always, but many times we're looking at what's detrimental if they're diabetic and they're not controlling their sugar, or if, you know, they're obese and they have all this anti-inflammatory component of what's going on with them. So we sometimes don't look at the functional medicine side, which might be a clue for us to consider and in looking into how we could be better with that. But what I would say is after having had more exposure, after having a, a, a lot more experience, I think it's a blend of a lot of different things. I think first is giving that patient the real true empowerment to say, how can you take upon yourself to be able to change the things that you can change, right? There are certain things that we know are going to be difficult for us. If you have someone who's in their teens or early 20s, they're probably going to be able to respond to an insult that, recall, that necessitates them needing healing a lot quicker than someone who might be more mature. But that doesn't mean that the more mature individual can't be able to say, you know what, how can I be able to balance what's going on from a hormonal standpoint? How can I be able to make sure that I don't have an imbalance from an inflammatory standpoint that's going to cause me challenges and issues? How can I be able to find ways that I have a good, stable basis of, to be able to use for protein and collagen and such so that I can be able to get a good response? So I, I think, you know, that's where um, I think as healthcare providers, we have to really kind of take it upon ourselves to say, it's not just about this didactic, you do what I say, but more so, how can we partner together to say, where do you want to go? And then let's help together us get there in collaboration. I love that. Because, yeah, before it was just, you know, everything's, if we, if we have a hammer, everything's a nail, right? And we, we're going to use a modality right. first. But, yeah, it's so, it's so complicated the way we heal. And, but for some, one, one question I'm always wondering is why do some people that are seemingly healthy, they, they think they're doing everything right, they have an injury that has healed, quote, unquote, healed, but they still have pain. What are your thoughts on chronic pain and when tissues have completely healed? What, what do you think is going on there? Yeah, so that's a really complex question. And I, I think, you know, the easy piece is to focus just on kind of that asset aspect of nociception, right? So nociception being that you have this noxious stimuli, i.e. so it's something that's structural and that structural piece hasn't improved. And I think that's really, if you're kind of scientific and you're critical and you're an analytic, you're like, this is the only way that you're gonna have pain. But pain is much broader than that, which is what makes things a lot challenging. Uh, you know, it's not just you have one receptor that's activating that's giving you an issue. It could be that it's neuropathic, but it's, it's not just the nerve at the site. It might be how those nerves interconnect, how they go up to the spinal cord, how they come to your brain. And you know how people talk about, you know, mind over matter and really kind of being able to incorporate that brain component. Uh, I think some people feel like that's touchy feely, but there's a lot of connections that really do play a role in how you process pain and how you can be able to mitigate it. So I, I think that's a second piece. And then thirdly, I would say that there are different, definitely differences from an endocrine and humoral type piece that we don't always delve into, just to be quite frank. And there may be imbalances that exist between those pieces that also can be impactful to how chronic pain can be situated. So without going too far off tangent and talking for too long for your question, me, for me in context, I've had patients that have come to me that have had a knee replacement after surgery, right? And that knee replacement structurally, it looked perfect. And a surgeon is like, I did a great job. And the patient's like, no, you didn't because it still hurt and it hurts worse than what it was before. So how good of a job can it be even though it looks perfect like you erected the building and it's all lined up correctly, but it doesn't work for me, right? And so I think, you know, the question is, is within that context, you have to kind of step outside the no susception piece or the structural piece and say, well, all these other elements, what else can we be able to manipulate, adjust and improve in order for us to get to the outcome that we want? I agree. I mean, pain is so complicated. And when I first started, you know, practicing, we did the subjective pain scores and I don't know how many times I heard from people, I, you know what, doc? I have a high pain tolerance. Don't worry about me. I'm sure you hear that all the time too. Everybody has a high pain tolerance. Everyone's different. Everyone processes pain differently, but the brain is involved. The hormones are involved. You know, the injury, you know, our brain has memory of that injury itself. And so that can bring up more pain stinking of, <laughs> uh, you know, 
more involvement of that pain, it, just from a slight stimulus, you might say, okay, this pain is now a 10 out of 10. You're like, 10 out of 10, you should be in the hospital if it's 10 out of 10, right? But so many people just want to, or they, they think the pain's worse than it really is. And so it's kind of weird how we heal sometimes, the, the tendons and ligaments heal and the soft tissue heals, but we still have that pain. So that's kind of a complicated issue where functional medicine really has a, a great place in how nutrition and supplementation and other things, lifestyle factors can actually play a huge piece in that puzzle. And, I, and from what I understand, you, you are starting to incorporate uh, some of these principles into your practice. How do you incorporate um, some of these lifestyle measures into your practice today? You know, I think being totally frank, we're still kind of just coming into that <laughs> element because we know that it's a, a need. Much how that one patient was like, you could do better. We know we can do better. And I think many practices um, who are attempting to get there, they may understand it, but they don't always make the effort. And, I, and that's not to knock them, but for me, I feel like, like you know, we know that we're going to have not necessarily the most optimal piece to start. And that's okay, because at the end of the day is I think there's patients who want it and they're willing to settle at least in the short term and we get to where we need to be for an effort to say, how can we be able to at least address this, assess it, and then figure out how can we improve it? So for us, how we're starting off is looking at functional medicine analysis so we can be able to see what's going on with that, that person. So then we can be able to hopefully quantify where their starting point is so then we can see are we making improvements? And, 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 you know, for us, I think a lot of people are like, you know, well, let's try this, let's try that, let's try that. But you don't really have a way to be able to say, well, what was your starting point other than necessarily how you felt? And so much how we kind of use that ultrasound with the connection of how you feel, can we put something to it so we can then be able to see what's our tangible improvement as we try different efforts to be able to move forward. So just like uh, the old... Um the old analogy, what gets measured gets improved, right? So you guys are finding that baseline yeah. so you can track it versus just guessing, say, hey, you know, this might be working. Maybe it's, maybe it is, maybe it's not. So you guys are getting really, um, really precise, it seems like. Correct. That's which is doing. awesome. Awesome. So um, let's talk about, you know, some of these regenerative medicine um, treatments out there. And, and I want to dig into, I guess, first PRP, um, when you started using PRP and how it's, you know, impacted your practice um, from the, the, uh, I guess the, the, the first time. Sure. So, I mean, for us, you know, using PRP, which I, as your audience very well knows, very well knows, stands for platelet-rich plasma. Right? <laughs> and there's multiple different forms of it. There's different concentrations. There are different thought processes of how do you deploy it? Um, do you do it in one shot? Do you do multiple shots? Do you target the area in multiple different areas and spaces and such? But for me, really, it is very much about figuring out that individual person and seeing what's going on with them. So, for instance, you know, um, without being too um, overstating this, but we had a patient that a couple of patients that have come to us post-surgery where they've had a surgical insult that tried to fix what the problem was. And they were athletes. And just kind of give you the details, there was a young lady who's, I want to say, 19 years old who you would expect to heal really robustly. And she's an active basketball player, um, multiple leagues, doing things where she can be able to try to play collegiately, right? And she had a surgery and quite frankly, her father works within the healthcare system as an orthopedic physician's assistant to try to be able to help, you know, deal with this on a daily basis. So they went to a surgeon who was really well renowned in our area and after having done conservative care and physical therapy and such, they did the surgery to try to see if they can be able to improve one of the tendons to her knee and really structurally bring it back together. And structurally, it was back together, but she didn't have stability and she had pain. So they sought us out and they said, well, you know, maybe this might be a, an option. And that's just, we're going to throw a Hail Mary and see if maybe, maybe this might work, but we're not really too sure. And we're like, well, okay, so first of all, let's talk about what's taking place. We're taking, for us, we do autologous PRP. So we take blood from that person and we give it back to them. The only thing that we do differently is we isolate and we concentrate. So we can be able to get platelets at the site to be able to improve healing for a better response. And, and is, that not done, is that not done in every PRP clinic? Is that different than some others? Well, it depends on the person. There are some that actually won't isolate, they'll do whole blood. 
There's some that will do different components of leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor. Um, and for us and how we set up our clinic and how Regenix does it, that we actually have a lab on site. So we have a processor that really can concentrate higher than what she would get from a traditional centrifuge. So a standard centrifuge would get you somewhere between maybe seven and 10 X. And at times we've used concentrations as high as 20 X. Wow. So, okay. um, and, and that concentration does matter in this context. So for this particular lady, that's exactly what we did. Um, we went for a much higher concentration at discrete points where she had problems and issues. And not only have we been able to get her back to running five miles, she's been able to play basketball and get back into a competitive state. So like she is like over the moon with how happy she's been able to really get back to doing the things that she wants. So for us, from that standpoint, you know, it, it was definitely a success. That's amazing. How, how long was she in pain for before she got um, some, some final resolvement? I want to say it was easily about two years or so. Really? Okay. So she was in pain for a long time before she actually got any healing uh, to take place with the PRP. That's awesome. And so I'm sure, I know you see success stories like this all the time. They probably become more normal, normal because you do this all day long. But what are some other successful stories that you've had with PRP and maybe some long-term chronic injuries like that, like that basketball player? Yeah, sure. So actually, um, we had on the other end of the spectrum, a really active gentleman who was probably in his mid-60s or so, who's a water skier. And we were going, debating back and forth about whether we should be looking at stem cell versus PRP, because he had some pretty bad loss of cartilage. He had some challenges with the tendons of his knees. He could walk fine, and he could carry out most of his daily activities, but if he really wanted to push it, he just really couldn't do the things that he wanted to be able to do. And so we thought about it, but we felt like we could be able to get a, a good response in PRP. And really what we did was target a holistic approach to the knee. And so what I mean by that is for many patients that are familiar with the allopathic medicine, if you get a steroid or a quote unquote cortisone injection, they'll give it to you just intra-articular, meaning you get a shot right into the joint and you hope for it to spread and maybe cope the areas that are problematic or in question. And that's not what we do. Um, we do some of that, but what we think is that if you do that injection, how do you know that it's going to get to where you want it to be? So for us, what we do is not only, like I said before, take a look at the ultrasound. If there's an MRI, we try to identify are there focal areas that are problematic? Do we see different issues? And then come back to the patient and say clinically, hey, do you feel it here? Do you feel it here? Does it bother you at certain times of the day when you do this activity? So for this guy, because he was really focused on water skiing and, you know, there's a, a fair amount of knee flexion, there's a lot of torque with it. What we really wanted to see is, so in the most extreme positions, what gives you most of the problem? And so we knew, knew that we needed to deal with meniscus, we needed to deal with MCL, we needed to deal with LCL, in addition to what's going on with the components of his cartilage. And just being frank, for me, I never would have looked at ligamentous structures as in depth without having done some of this type of training to say, well, what about the pes answering versa? And what about if you take a look at this component of what's going on in your thigh? And how does the nerve potentially impact your musculature as it comes into the thigh where maybe you might need to look at how that all kind of comes together? So those are things that um, we did for that gentleman. And he's been really happy back out doing the stuff that he wants to be able to do on the water. That's amazing. So I guess the analogy I always use like the spray and pray method, right? Versus the precise method, which is, which you guys are totally doing. Um, in addition to PRP, do y'all utilize any other modalities like physical therapy, active, you know, being active? How does that work in your practice? Yeah. So we actually do a couple of different things and, you know, obviously, you know, right now in the time that we're speaking in 2021, there's been craziness with the pandemic and everything else. Um, and, we feel like we've leveraged a lot of telehealth connectivity pieces in an aggressive fashion, but at the same time, we also want to be able to leverage that personal humanistic touch too. And, and I think to be frank with you, it really kind of depends on the person on how motivated and how much they need one versus the other. So <clears throat> what we decided to do is to say, okay, can we find physical therapy programs that are not just a piece of paper, but that are on video? that we can give to patients that we can construct from thousands of different programs. And it's no cost to the patient. They go on and when they do the activities, we know, because we can tell whether they're actually doing it. It gives us a report back whether they're being compliant or not. 
So we have an idea that we can encourage and say, well, maybe you might need to do a little bit more of this exercise. But then at the same time, we also find therapists that are close to those individuals. We have people that come to us from um, sometimes a, a number of hours away. So we can be able to have both that augmentation from the therapist that's there with them, as well as if they're like, well, you know what, I want to be a little bit more cloistered. We can be able to do some activities or blend them both together, which I think is the best of both worlds. So that's how we look at therapy from that context. We believe a lot in dry needling. We be, believe a lot in being able to kind of bring that healing to the tissue and then figuring out, you know, what are the activities that a person enjoys? And without being too cliche, it's like, what is that person's why? And we can figure out what that person's why is, then we can figure out what are the movement strategies that are going to be a fit. I got guys that come to me that are big into MMA, they're big into jiu-jitsu, that, you know, they know if they get into an omoplata, they know if they get into a triangle, they know if they get, you know, in, into different dynamics, it's going to give them problems with their shoulders and their arms and their elbows and how that's going to impact them. But they also have different mobility drills that can be able to allow them to have, you know, a better overall health, but we have to focus on what are the problems that they're having at times. That's, that's awesome. I love how y'all do that. And just so everyone listening who didn't catch it, you guys are doing telehealth with some of these patients. So from my understanding, people will have to obviously fly in or drive in to the location for the exam and the treatment for the regenerative medicine side. But then after that, you guys are monitoring them um, wherever they are virtually with this app. Can you explain that and talk a little bit more about how that works? Yeah, so actually we have a really aggressive telehealth suite just as a whole as a practice, which I think is one of the things that makes us unique for our practice. And this is one of the reasons why we kind of take that moniker cutting edge which I think is a little bit bold, but um, at the same time, I think we back it up with a few things. So not only do we do telehealth with like a video component, we have a backup telehealth program for people that have challenges with like, oh, Zoom kicks my butt, it's hard for me to do that. So we have a different type of app and then we have another type of app and then we have a third type of app if we have to in order to be able to have video, one. Two, <clears throat> one of the things that we really leverage within this context is one of those apps actually allows for individuals to be able to reach us through HIPAA appropriate um, text message. So traditionally, you know, patients and physicians sometimes, if the physician has felt comfortable, has given out their cell phone. But the, the problem and the issue with that is that your health information could be acquired, you know, and so right. what we wanted to do is find ways to be able to be safe about that. And so we found a safe way to deal with that. But more importantly, in some ways, one of the things that we also wanted to do is that everyone has good days and bad days, right? And many times we'll remember the good days and we won't remember the bad. And sometimes we'll remember the bad days and we won't remember the good. So in the pain circle, we've always talked about having pain journals, but no one remembers to actually write that stuff down. So built into this app, one of the things that we have is a way for you to be able to track it. And so when you come to our visit, we know what your month's been like, as opposed to just a day or two days. And this is thinking from a regenerative medicine standpoint, when we've said, all right, let's look at the whole scope of this for not just two days, but how has this been? And can we give you the interpretive picture of what we see? And then you tell us whether this actually fits what you've been through. So that's probably that second piece of where we look at from a telehealth standpoint to say, how can we be able to blend that together? And then not only that, we have the physical therapy piece that's in place. And then finally, for those patients that are open and willing to it, we also have kind of the mental component where we look at what's going on with your sleep, what's going on with your anxiety, what's going on with your depression, and we track that and trend it. And, it, and for some of our patients that are a little more stoic, they're like, well, I don't know if I'm really going to have all that changes. And then we can show them graphically. Well, actually, you were pretty depressed at this point in time. And that's not something to feel bad about. You had a really bad pain day at that time, too. And now let's see how that impacts your mood because this is maybe why you might be a little bit more snappy at the dog. And this is why you might have been a little bit more reflective and, you know, not as great with your eating at this time. So we yes. can show you how this looks, how this impacts you, because you're not just, you know, this automaton that has to do everything the right way. There are things that influence you and it's going to impact your overall health. And by measuring it, as you mentioned before, now we can be able to be able to improve it. That's really cutting edge because I, I have not heard of anything like that before. And it makes, because I used to have my patients do a pain journal. Say, hey, I want you to mark down your pain, you know, and would they do it? Half would, half wouldn't, right? Uh, so it, it was always the things like, hey, I want you to monitor what activity makes it worse. What makes it better? What food makes you feel better? What foods make you feel worse? We know that depression and pain have a big 
influence on each other. And if you're having pain, you probably have some depression. You're probably not going to be as happy and as joyful with your kids, with your wife, with your family, and yep. your sleep's probably going to be impacted, right? So it's this huge cascade that you guys seem to be addressing all together. So it's not a come to your clinic once, get an injection, and then you're done, right? It's this whole process of monitoring and really impacting that patient from multiple different avenues. That's amazing. And so um, you mentioned a few cool things there, and um, I want to unpack a little bit. So you're a fan of dry needling. Do you utilize it in your practice, or do you have other PTs or chiros that, that do that for you? Yeah, we have both PTs and chiros that do it for us so that they can be able to assess, evaluate, um, because we don't want to just have just one set of eyes on the person. We want to be able to say, okay, well, what do you think? Do you think that there's maybe some some weaknesses or some um, degrees of, of challenges in strength in other areas that maybe I might have missed or we didn't see on ultrasound or imaging? And if so, let's see if we can be able to bolster it. Nice. So it's kind of a team approach is what you're saying. Awesome. Well, let's talk about some. Uh, so I want to get get into the differences between PRP and stem cells. Can you help differentiate those two for our listeners? Sure, I'll do my best. So um, the best way I would kind of characterize this and how Regenix has had this sort of uh, cartoon version is if you imagine the construction site. PRP is like that uh, contractor that's directing individuals to say all right, we need for your healing factors to come and deal with this at this site over here and then deal with this over here. And so if we have enough of those individuals with a loud enough voice, we can be able to get healing factors where we need for them to be. Stem cell and how we deploy it is not only does it attract that context of other healing factors, it's also integrated within the construct. So they can form bricks to be able to be utilized and deployed in the building of the edifice to be able to make it better, stronger, so that you can have a much more robust response. I like that analogy. I like that analogy. So um, what kind of different injuries or diagnoses would you use PRP versus stem cell? For me, I think it, number one, without being too diverting on that question, I think it depends on the person. And we oh, really yeah. have to kind of like personalize that for that individual. Um, cause there are times where it could go either way. I, I think there are, for us, normally we try to start with a PRP element because it's a little bit less invasive. And what we're trying to do is to see if we can do a little bit to be able to get a big return. However, if we feel like that patient or per that person has, has a, such a problem that we don't think PRP is going to quite get it done. We just, we're very forthright. And to be frank with you, this is the conversation that I have with the patient. It's not like I'm going to say, you have to have this or you have to have that. This is what I think is going to give you benefit. And this is the downside. This is what I think is possibly going to help you on this end. And this is where we might miss out. So how do you feel like, which one do you think you want to utilize? And what are your thoughts about how you want to move forward? So that's really how we differentiate. For us, we do all the things from spine, starting in the neck, even starting in the jaw all the way down to the feet. So we're pretty comprehensive um, from cervical, thoracic, lumbar, shoulder, elbow, hands, knee, wrist, hip, you know, ankle, feet. So we do the whole dynamic of the person to try to see if we can be able to help improve problems and issues they have. That's very cool. And um, a question I want to, that leads me to is, since you're doing the neck, you're doing, you know, head to toe. I, I know some doctors that don't do that. And I know your background enables you, you know, having the anesthesiology pain background and now into the regenerative side. Does that make you more comfortable getting to these smaller, more intricate areas than maybe another doctor who's like, hey, I'm only going with the larger, uh, more robust areas, I guess? I appreciate the question. I'm going to take the high road on that and talk about <laughs> what we do as opposed to what someone else does. Yeah. <laughs> um, for us, you know, it, it's interesting because it's actually today's Friday. Just on Wednesday, I was doing a thoracic intradiscal injection um, of stem cells. And, you know, um, if I hadn't done other types of treatments where we have to go into the thoracic region, there's a lot of things that are uh, challenging there. Besides spinal cord, you also have lungs and potentially drop the lung that you have to be very careful of. So when you're trying to get into discal, you have to avoid nerve roots that you don't want to cause nephraxia. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of construct that can be problematic. I think having good judgment um, and making the patient aware of the potential challenges and issues, and what's your plan and strategy to be able to avoid it? 
um, I, I think is also kind of huge. You know, just because you've done it doesn't mean that you've done it on that person. So right. to be able to lay out, um, number one, why this is going to be safe for them. Second, how is this going to hopefully be able to give them the result they want? And number three is to be able to say, how are we planning this attack to improve things? So this is what we see on your x-ray. This is what we see in your thoracic spine. And so when we come to these areas, this is where we're going to have difficulties, and this is how we're going to surmount those. So I think though that's kind of the way that we take on some of the challenging areas that we know are maybe not quite as commonplace, but to bring the patient in to have an understanding of this, these are the difficulties, and these are some of the things that, frankly, we can't avoid. And there may be less than 1% risk, but you need to know what those risks are so you can make an informed decision. Ryan, so if I need stem cells, I definitely know where I'm going to go at this point. <laughs> I appreciate it. Hopefully that won't be the case, but yeah, so, I'd appreciate it. No, I, I mean, I've actually had personal stories with my own ankle injuries, and I've done, you know, PRP and stem cells, and stem cells definitely gave me some, some pretty good relief. And so I'm definitely a fan. Um, so you talked about being an invasive, more more invasive anyways, for getting stem cells. Can you talk about the extraction and the harvesting process uh, with stem cells and what you guys in particular at your clinic and how that works for anyone who's not too familiar with this? Sure. So for us, we use traditionally a bone marrow aspirate, right? And there are other clinics that use adipose, um, I think I see your cute dog in the background. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, what I was going to say is, I'm sure you'll edit that out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it. it. Makes it fun. <laughs> um, what I was going to say is for us, you know, when I first saw the procedure, I was like, okay, being an anesthesiologist, what we do, and I know other clinics do it differently. They just use local we actually put people off to sleep so that they don't have to have that kind of experience. Now there's some patients that want to be awake and we'll be happy to accommodate them if they wish. But I would say nine times out of 10, most people go off to sleep. And what we do is we use the iliac crest as our harvest site. And technically we use both ultrasound and fluoro because we have the means to go to do so. So we'll find that iliac crest. We'll give local at the site in a couple of different ways in addition to them being off to sleep mainly because we don't want you to wake it up sore. Um, so then we'll go after a couple different spots. Traditionally, it's somewhere anywhere from six to maybe sometimes eight, because we believe by going into those multitude of different spots, you can get a better increased robust amount of cells. So you can get a better response. And that's really how we do it in order to be able to get ourselves. That's cool. So um, is, was Asian, is Asian factor for harvesting cells? I know when we get to a certain point, we have less and less mesenchymal stem cells. What is the age cutoff and is, is every person different as far as that goes? Yeah, so I get that question all the time. <laughs> and I have a number of people that are like, man, how they would say it is a little different. They would say, am I too old for this really to work? And what I would say at patients is first and foremost, I don't know, but I doubt it. Uh, for us, what we do is we count cells. So we know what your cell numbers are. We, and we know for most part, because Regenix has something that's called a, a registry. So across our network, we're able to see, because we have a standard operating procedure for different body parts to say, okay, if you're gonna do this area, what are the number of cells that are gonna give you the best outcome at different levels? And can you then be able to do multiple spots? So for instance, you know, a lot of patients will come in and say, hey, I have a left shoulder, I have a right knee, and maybe I have a left wrist. Can you do it all at the same time? And you very well may not want to do that, number one, because the person will probably be pretty sore afterwards. But <laughs> number two is you're diluting your potency of your cells that you have, right? And so it depends on how many cells that person has. So if you start off with a certain amount and you say, you know what, we really need to get this shoulder, then we really get the shoulder. So coming back to your original question about the age, um, I think it really depends on what our number of cells is as for our count and how can we be able to make that better. But what I also say is when we do our draw, most of the time we'll be able to generate PRP at the same time. Okay. And so we won't just go after like, how can I put this? If you have a target zone and this is the area when you get want to get it, we feel like there's other areas that are probably integral to the structural integrity and stability. And so we'll try to combine that to be able to provide a more robust response. 
That's cool. Is there anything, because I know stem cells are, are costly for a, for a lot of people. Are there any things that you found to be beneficial in, in addition to the stem cells, maybe a, a collagen supplement, maybe a activity or exercise? Is there anything that can enhance the biological activity of these cells? Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I'm having you on my podcast <laughs> and my live stream, because I want to talk to you more about some of the areas of your own expertise. But yeah, at the moment, one of the things that we've been doing is we've really been looking at collagen products that make sense because we think that that's going to be incredibly helpful in laying down that layer that's going to be um, instrumental in terms of you getting a good healing response, one. Two is, you know, really what we'll talk about is how, are you doing the stuff that you know you need to do? Have you been able to stop smoking? Have you been able to improve your overall diet? Do you feel like, you know, you have that balance of what, what's going on from what, how you, you're eating and how that is impacting your overall health? So um, I think we delve into that to an extent. Um, when we talk about exercise as a whole, you know, there are different thought processes that are out there. There's some that have that construct of, you know, are you getting in at the very least daily walks? But preferably, if you're able to start having some increased weight-bearing type exercises, it could, in theory, be able to produce an increased, more robust response. And so, depending on the person, what their activity is like, then we'll talk to them about whether they feel comfortable with that. Very cool. I love that. I can't wait to talk with you more about it on your on your show. Um, so, with the, with the new research and advancements in you know this regenerative field, um, if you could predict the future, or if you have any you know enlightenment to what you think may happen with the way the re research is going now, what do you think could happen in ten years with the regenerative field? Yeah, I would say, let's take the optimistic bend on that as opposed to kind of just sitting in them sort of a, a narrowed way. Um, to me, I think uh, now there's starting to become a push for something that's called interventional orthopedics. Okay. And interventional orthopedics basically stands for how can you leverage regenerative medicine in a percutaneous fashion to address a musculoskeletal issue. So in a less fancy way, um, basically it means that we're targeting tendons, tissue, muscle, bone, by using our own cells without us necessarily having to replace it with plastic, with cement, with being able to bring metal into play. And when we look at the, the orthopedic industry as a whole, from peripheral joint replacements to us talking about doing um, fusions, we think that maybe 70% of orthopedics can be addressed in this fashion. Wow, that's incredible. So that's, that's more biologics. Biologic is right. what they call it. Yeah, cool. Um, so in a perfect world, everyone can be able to afford stem cells, but how do you see stem cells becoming more affordable in the future? Is that even an option or is they, are they always going to be more of a costly procedure? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good question. I think that looks at healthcare dynamics as a whole. Um, so without going too far into that, you know, for me, um, as I became a, um, a solo uh, entrepreneur for having my own practice, uh, I actually did an MBA for, uh, for physicians. And wow. um, one of the things that I was going to say is that was great about the program that I'm part of or, or went to both during it and as alum, um, our classmates and colleagues, we go to different international sites to see how healthcare is better and how it might be worse to figure out how you can be able to look at improving things. And so I, I think when you ask that question of you know, cost, um, I think sometimes when you look at a global perspective of how those things um, are done, it can maybe give us examples of how we might be able to leverage that. Um, if we stay within the context of the states, you know, I think it is really gonna be dependent upon one, is this ever gonna be an offering from insurance? And I think that there's a number of reasons for why insurance should certainly consider it. First, because the cost factor of this versus the knee replacement, not just to the insurance, but also to the patient um, in terms of what they can be able to do, not having certain limitations and be able to look at the longevity of the response that you get. I think many people think this is like a steroid injection which might last you for a month or if you're lucky a year. And what we're talking about is comparing this to surgical outcomes, right? And when you take a look at that, you're easily going to have a savings for the insurer of probably anywhere from 30 to maybe 45%. And so if they really start looking into it on a granular nature, I think that there's value that's there. 
The problem is, is getting that to change the status quo is very difficult. And there's a number of factions that are out there. So um, I think that patients and individuals have kind of have, have to give the impetus to make that be a viable option for insurers to really say, hey, hmm, this is something that we really need to look at. So that's one. Two, I think that there is starting to become a bigger, more well aware employer based insurance movement that have said, you know what? Hey, we're a business. We are insuring our employees. I think we need to find a way that can be cost effective. And they have made that leap and that jump versus some of the big, you know, blues and anthems and things like that that have said, well, let's kind of stick with the standard because there are reasons for us to stick with the standard. And employers have said, well, does it work? Is it helping our employees? Then this should be something that we should do. So I think that's kind of a movement that's also influencing how healthcare is being delivered. So you're, so you're saying it's going to take some time, but there is hope. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. That is the summary. <laughs> got that it. That long soliloquy <laughs> that I just had. I, lo- I love that. I love that. No, thank you for that. So um, this is a question I just can't, kind of thought of. Um, I know you see a lot of athletes, and you know, probably some professional level athletes as well. Um, and so the athletes want to get back to the sport as quickly as possible. How would their treatment differ from maybe an everyday person who doesn't need to get back on the field or the court? as quickly as professional athlete, would, would you do more for them or would you do the same amount as, as you would do for every person? I think, I, I hate to give you this cliche answer. It depends. Um, why I think it makes sense for athletes to look at orthobiologics is the following. I know it's going to seem like, wait, that seems counterintuitive. It, it's not about your play on the field or on the court. It's what's, or on the mats. It's what's happening afterwards. So frequently when we do surgery, we're removing something. We're mm-hmm. cutting something out. And what that does is it hastens the onset of arthritis. Yep. So if you had this surgery, you know, in your early 20s, you may start having arthritis in your late 30s and 40s yep. as opposed to 20 years later. And I know that's kind of really easy to be like, oh, I'll worry about that when it happens. But what if you didn't even have to worry about that? So let's put that as like maybe the, the number one piece. But number two is you want to get back and say, you know what, I'm really looking to be able to get after it and get into it. The upside for doing regenerative medicine is that your rehab is probably going to be at least 30%, if not less, because you're not having the insult of being cut. And and you will have a stronger response. And the reason why I say you'll have a stronger response is so, for instance, when you look at ACL tears and how we do percutaneous ACL repair, right? When you do a percutaneous ACL repair, it still keeps the natural trajectory of the ACL. When you do an ACL graft, you have to change the angle, the orientation, and it changes the biomechanics of the knee. So that's gonna influence how healthy you are. Now, it doesn't mean that you won't come back strong. You will, but you also have the likelihood that you'll have more of a tear again in the future because you've altered the natural native state of how that joint was. So I'd say twofold. One, the long-term, and number two, is your rehab will be shorter and it probably will be more robust in keeping with your natural healing tendencies of what your body was like to begin with. Right. So instead of removing something and just hoping that it stays the same or doesn't get worse, you're adding, right? You're adding more positive benefits or net benefits to that patient, to that anatomy. I love that. Very cool. So, so Doc, we've talked a lot about regenerative medicine today. I want to talk more about you and how you stay fit and how you stay healthy. What are some of the, the best healthy, um, tips that you want to, that you live by on a daily basis? Sure. So um, for me, you know, right now, one of the things that I do is I do some intermittent fasting. Um, I think that there are some healthy components of that from a much longer time frame than just like what your weight happens to be. And when we talk about telomere length and those type of things, um, in terms of the things that I do is I, I aggressively lift and I do cardio, um, and that cardio piece involves some components of jujitsu and a few other things along those lines. So, um, and that's one of the reasons why I know the struggle <laughs> of having a little knocks here and there. Obviously, the pandemic has changed some of those things, uh, you know, during the current time. But to have an idea about why someone has pain because of the things that they've been through, it really helps you be able to put yourself in their shoes. It totally does. It totally does. So you mentioned intermittent fasting. That's a, a new thing I, I presume that you've started. Um, is that the best health hack that you would recommend to somebody that's simple and effective and doesn't really cost anything, right? It's you're actually saving money in some, some regards. 
to me, I think, you know, I, I think based on the person, you have to kind of see where you're at from a glucose standpoint. If you have elements of diabetes or things along those lines, then you obviously have to kind of balance that. I, my, me personally, what I would say as a hack, I would say I think mobility is key and king. Yep. So, um, and, and I think starting off slow, uh, I think many people underrate just being able to do a walk or a daily walk. You know, I think that there's a lot of value to that. And, and I think from there, you can really be able to branch out into how you utilize that for your overall health would probably be my kind of tip and trick for a hack. Love that. Do you recommend a certain step count, like 10,000 steps a day, or do you say just, just get moving? What to me, I think you just get moving personally. And the reason why I say that is because not everyone can jump to that goal right off the bat. And it then becomes frustrating when you don't hit that goal. Or you get the goal once, and then you're like, "What? I it's hard for me to keep up with that goal. Why not start it at a small point? Let's find what's enjoyable about it, and then figure out how you tweak it in order to get to where you want to be. Love it. Love it. So if you're on a desert island, and you got to pick one health-related uh, tool, it could be a supplement, it could be uh, something else that you use daily, what would you choose and why? Wow, that's a good question. I like it. Uh, hmm. I'd love to query you with another comeback question, but I'm going to play within the context of the rules. Uh, you can come uh, back. That's fine. You can, that's fine. Me, on a, on a deserted island, I would say, I think you really got to worry about hydration. And I right. think everyone has to deal with that. Um, and, and I think there are many people that don't even give context to how well we're taking in water. So before we talk about animal sources, plant sources, how you're dealing with this, it's really, are you being able to give your body that natural piece that's helping you really be congruent with everything else that you need to me personally? That's how I would look at it. I love it. That's the first hydration answer I've got so far. So I love that. Um, I was always thinking I'll be drinking like the coconut water on the island or something, but <laughs> hydration. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love it. I know it would be good for you, but sometimes you got to figure out what's your fit. So. <laughs> That's right. No, I love that answer. Uh, thank you for that. So if you got to put your message on a billboard and you got to put one to two sentences of health related content, what would you want your message to be for everyone to see and why? To me, I think um, the reason why I got into medicine is I don't come from a, a physician family or a healthcare family. I got into medicine because my father had a pretty uh, aggressive stroke that really took um, a lot of things that he was able to do as a firefighter um, off the table. And I think when dealing with the healthcare system, many people are not privy to knowing they have options. They're directed into one channel and that's the channel that they say, okay, this is what I got, and this is what I have to sell for. So if I was really putting something on a billboard, I'd probably have something like, the first line is, you have options, and you have more hope for treatment than what you know of. I love that. Such, such wise words to live by. Okay, so we've had an amazing segment today, and I would love to probably do this again with you in the future. But where can people find you? Where can they find uh, and follow your website? And where can they follow all your work? Sure, I appreciate it. Um, our website's pretty easy. It's cuttingedgepain.com. Not because we're cutting you, but more so because we're trying to lead sort of that push for how can things be better. Um, we have both that website as well as a newsletter that you can find a link to. We also have a YouTube channel that covers a number of different topics that I'd love to have you on for our live stream. Um, and for there, we cover topics like regenerative medicine, minimally invasive pain, as well as other things about how can you improve your health as a whole. Um, so, and that's, that site is uh, Cutting Edge Pain Relief on YouTube. Awesome. So cutting edge pain relief for anyone looking for a regenerative medicine doctor, Dr. Landrum is the man. Go check out his stuff. And we really appreciate your time today and all the insightful messages that you shared. So thank you again, doc. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Fredrickson health show. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a single episode. While you're at it, leave us a rating and review. 
follow us on social media, and subscribe to our email newsletter for more information.